Okie doke. My features have disappeared. I look like one of them Love Island filters. Um, kind of like it. Right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Widowed AF. You're here with Rosie Gilmoss and my co-host, Jonathan Gilmoss. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I was waiting for you to speak. <laughs> I, 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 I dropped my iPad, but no, <laughs> I'm not in my usual place, am I? So, well, I was going to say, under normal circumstances, we'd probably re-record this and try and gloss it up a little bit, but we are coming to you in a WAF special from the glorious Isle of Wight. We travelled over yesterday and we are currently camped out in bedrooms within the um, apartment that we've hired for a couple of days, uh, attempting to record this episode while um, one of the children is in the bathroom, the dog's outside, the other three children are, are not abandoned, but they're with their uncle on the beach. So let's see, shall we? Let's see yeah. how this is. <laughs> it's going to be the best episode ever. Oh, <laughs> yeah. ah, crash, who knows? Yeah. So we've got a couple of things we really wanted to talk about this week. Uh, one is obviously Nico's episode. We had the lovely Nico on on Monday and she spoke incredibly eloquently about losing her husband, Mark, uh, to brain cancer. One of the really key points that we pulled away from this episode was that the idea that actually they really embraced this time and the fact that she describes it as being beautiful and you know, that they were kind of blessed to have it because knowing that somebody is going to die but having the opportunity to a long enough opportunity to do things with them before they become terribly terribly poorly i guess is a, a gift in some way if you if you if you are inclined to look at the positives which nico so obviously is which i guess once again speaks volumes about her doesn't it yeah yeah definitely i think she liked to do the um the cliche living in the moment as well and not worrying about what's coming um yeah, yeah definitely on the positive side and that's something that so many of us struggle with. I think you know, many people struggle with it anyway, the idea that you almost can't enjoy the highs because you're so frightened of the lows. And I know that ever since that knock at the door came, I'm very frightened of saying that my life is, is happy, that it's great, you know, which it is, it absolutely is. But you you sort of say it and kind of cower a little bit and think, oh, God, you know, dare I say it? But actually you can't we're not that powerful you can't jinx it can you you the only disservice you do to good times is by not enjoying them um because you know if you what's the point in doing things if you're not going to enjoy them i guess i guess if you're constantly living under this fear but suddenly it, it isn't as easy to fix as, as just saying that I, I do appreciate so i have no personal experience of uh living with somebody who's who's dying from a terminal illness um and and you do, John. So there must have been elements in Nico's episode that you could relate to quite personally. There were a few, um, but it's it's weird when I think back to that time. It is like an absolute roller coaster. Like I couldn't pinpoint the timeline or anything around it. Not not very well. So that protracted over two years. I mean, whilst Nico came away with a positive experience, there's a stress scar somewhere. There has yeah. to be because there's highs and lows. And whilst you celebrate the highs, like some of the lows and the final low is, you know, it, it's it's not the best of journeys. But good good on Nico for pulling the positives out of yeah. what could have been a living nightmare. And I guess also a lot of it is dependent on how incapacitated they are by this illness. Because some of our guests, you know, their, their late partner has been running marathons, you know, fairly close up to the end. And... Um, Emma's husband was sitting up having gin and tonics and you I, I actually like Sarah and her that sort of last good day but for some people they're able to live almost quite a normal life but a semi-normal existence before it ultimately takes them but for others they're quite incapacitated from very early on so of course that that is a factor so having had this opportunity to speak with Nico uh, you know extensively about uh, her story and her loss Another key thing that really stood out to me was the idea of openness and communication with her children. Now, prior to Ben dying, I really had no idea how to speak to children about bereavement. I doubt anybody does unless you work in a, in a job that requires you to. So you sort of want to hedge around and use all the sort of soft wording. And of course, you can't. You have to say dead. And, you know, it, it, it's really brutal. But from what I can infer from Nico's episode there was 
because of the uh, communication and the openness that they kept between themselves and the children, the family unit just got tighter and tighter and the kids were kind of prepared for what was going to happen. And I don't know, like you I talk a bit about you know, putting on the layers of armour and it's always like by being that open and preparing them, it's not going to soften the blow, but you've got a little bit more armour to take the force of it with. Yeah, I've been in Nico's position, or well, Nico Mark's position of, uh, he was terminal. It's um, the end. The end is going to come. They have to be honest with the children. Mm. Um, you know, if if there's always hope attached to it, then you're not you're not as honest sometimes. Well, I used to say that hope would be the thing that would kill me when Ben was gone because well-meaning strangers, never anybody I knew, used to you know you mustn't give up hope. He might be out there somewhere, and of course, actually, that would have been incredibly dangerous for me because it would have stopped me ever starting to rebuild a life if I was sat you know like the um stereotypical you know the widow's walk that you get seaside towns where they yeah. sort of walk around waiting for their love to return from sea and I really felt oh I don't know like I don't I, I don't know I don't know like I suppose it's so easy that could have been me I mean minus the very elegant seafront house I suppose <laughs> well I know it, I, this is the worst link ever I do apologize for the clunkiness I am not <laughs> on my and where you're going as well. Uh, I was going to do a really seamless segue into talking about the fact that we're at the seaside. See, absolutely seamless. Perfect. Yeah, I thought so. I thought so. So we are here on the Isle of Wight. The reason we are here is, A, it's a really awesome part of the world. I don't know if you haven't been here before. Uh, you can, you should. It's, it's really, really beautiful. I've been coming here for many years because Ben's mum and dad moved here. They sort of retired here. And I was party to many a Moss family gathering in their, their beautiful house they had here. Um, they've since moved into a, a different house, but the two of his brothers still live here and his mum is still here. So we do come over as regularly as we possibly can and, and spend some time with them. And this time I found this really awesome kind of flat above some shops, I guess, it, um, by the beach. And I have to say, it's been really lovely. We can virtually sort of watch the kids from the window. I mean, I hasten to say we're not, but, you know, if you had older kids, you could. And it just, I don't know, it feels really comfortable and, and natural just being away as a family. Um, we've only threatened to take them home once so far, but there is one day left to go. But well, I do know that there will be listeners out there who are wondering how this works for us as a dynamic. Because John, you know, Ben was one of six, so the baptisms were fine when you met that lot. But you come every time, you come and have a cup of tea with his mum, and you're quite friendly with one of his brothers as well. And it is a weird and unusual family dynamic, but it works. And I guess for you, you know, how do you find that relationship, you know, being around Ben's family? Um, well, I've been, I've been at the start. It was, it was awkward, mm -hmm. um, but you know, um, slowly, slowly, tentatively, on both sides, we we got to know each other, and um, like now it's just like part of the extended family. And yeah. and, and you know, their Ben's children need to see his family. They need to still be involved. They need to know where their roots are. Um, and much the same way you do with Sarah's families, mm -hmm. it was tentative to start with. But then over time, you know, gently, gently, on all on all sides, we we, you know, felt where our boundaries were and where where we were happy to be, and actually where we've landed, I think, out of mutual respect, is a really, really good place. That's really good for both us, the family, and the children. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And it does take work, of course, it does. You have to put time in, and so much of it, I guess, depends perhaps on the relationship you had before. And I'm just kind of starkly aware of how difficult this relationship, the in-law relationship, becomes when, when a person dies. And we, we've had, a, I guess, almost a 50-50 split, really, of people who've been very supportive. I'm thinking of Sasha, you know, and how much love they have wrapped her in. But we've also spoken to a lot of people who have nothing to do with them, they're angry with them. You know, Emma Bellamy left a voice note talking about Jamie's father not speaking to her because she had, he'd seen the car of her new partner outside the house. And... I guess we are dealing with some really, really big feelings here, aren't we? Because these people have lost a child and I just, it's unimaginable, isn't it? And so the way they react and the way they perhaps behave, much like ours, is not going to be normal. But it, I don't know if I've got a solution here, but I think giving each other kind of the equity that you need because of the grief um, it doesn't excuse all behaviour, but I think you have to kind of meet in the middle a little bit sometimes. 
I agree. It's like, it, it, you know, it's, it's the gently, gently. Generally, when there's a point of anger or a flashpoint, it boils down to an emotion somewhere. And if, if people could get to that core emotion, generally you can make a resolution. But, that you know, that's easier said than done. Like, Yeah, you know, it I, is. And we talk about, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm particularly thinking back to, um, again, Emma's episode and how her husband didn't want to be forgotten. You know, they kind of leaving this legacy. And I suppose as the parent of somebody who's died, you may, and, and I, I mostly wrongly would perceive that a new partner is replacing them. And even though logically and practically you may not know, you may know that is not the case, the fire of emotion that will be burning in you means that your knee-jerk reaction is very much that, you know, well, you're replacing them, you know, fuck you kind of thing. Um, yeah. And often once that sort of split is, is done, it's very difficult to repair it. I think having children, I guess, it, it helps because most of the time, for the good of children, people will, will cultivate a relationship. Yeah. But it, it, it is difficult and it, it gets harder when you form a new relationship. And like we said, we, you know, we've been very fortunate that it, they have accepted us as this kind of dysfunctional <laughs> patchwork tribe that we are. Felt like a travelling circus yesterday, loading the car up, honestly, it's ridiculous. Stuff we need to go away but yeah I and I'm I, I'm very very fond of Sarah's sister Lorna and, and her mum and, and we we often do family things with them it it, it takes time and, and it does take work but it does if you can get it to work it is worth it but again you know tell us tell us your stories tell us your experiences of in-laws I'd, I'd like to hear positive I'd like to hear negative if you're happy to do so but I shared experience you know guys let's let's talk about these things and how you find it because um it isn't always easy. It isn't. And I sometimes, in fact, earlier today, Ben's youngest brother, who's just watching him on the beach right now, he, Tabby ran into his arms and he picked her up and she wrapped her legs around, you know, did that sort of lovely cuddle that they do. And I just, and he looks so much like Ben. And you do get that almost kind of like, whoa, sideswipe. But it's less catastrophic now. The first time one of his brothers came over, I just wouldn't look at them and cried. Um, now I will at least, you know, make some eye contact, maybe. So anyway, I think we are probably going to wrap that up there because we are uh, a little bit concerned that somebody may need us, a dog might bark, I don't know, a seagull might appear at the window or something. But I'm really glad that we managed to, to do this while we were here because I love the idea of just being able to pack the iPads and do this wherever we are because, um, you know, that's kind of what this is. It's a warts and all podcast really, isn't it? We we try and be as professional as we can in the production, but actually who, who doesn't want to hear a bit of reality sometimes? So... We are back with you on Monday. We have a really, really interesting episode, actually. This is a, a friend of mine called Tash who's coming on, and we got history together, and um, even I didn't know the full extent of her story. So she, it, it's a different vibe to what we've had lately, and I think you guys are going to love it. So for now, please take care of yourselves, and we will be back with you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.